Today I'm learning about Napoleon's battle at Wagram, Austria. I don't know if that's good or bad. Probably bad. Oh no. Fire dog bite. Well, that was unfortunate. That almost seems impossible. The, the Austrians. Boot. Hello everybody, Roger says hey. So in our last video, we left off where Napoleon had been defeated by Austria at Aspern. I recall kind of mentioning that it kind of felt like a turning point in the war, and some of your comments also kind of reinforced that idea. Speaking of the comments, you know what time it is. We're going to head back to that video, actually, and see what you had to say about it. If you're here just for the reaction and you don't really want to listen to this part, hit the chapter marker for the reaction and go straight there and watch it now. But I would like to have a little discussion with the rest of you about Napoleon so let's go do it. So in this video, I had a question about all of the uniforms. I was wondering kind of like what inspired the designs of their uniforms back in this day. And kind of thinking how camo came to be. Now obviously, I understand why they didn't use camo back in Napoleon's day because they were fighting in lines and you're not trying to really hide from the enemy. You're trying to confront them directly. So what purpose would there be in trying to blend in with your environment? But some of you kind of told me that there was camo going way back even into ancient times to an extent, not camo as we kind of know it today but a lot of you I think brought up the British 95th rifles as like one of the very first I don't know regiments what, what would you call it to kind of use camouflage G Peters says in that time uniform colors were very important because in a smoke filled battle you had to be able to instantly tell apart friend from foe but later on when weapons became more accurate and less smoky it was not very handy to wear such bright uniforms so they changed to a more dark color uniforms that could blend in with the surrounding area and this took place from 1850 to 1914 and that brings us up to World War One, where I think camouflage really became to be used in mass numbers. Uh, Samuel Bousfield says the British were promising subsidies to Austria. For the most part of the Napoleonic Wars, Britain were the major financial backers of coalitions opposed to Napoleon. Makes perfect sense. They had a pretty big empire from previous videos I've watched. Uh, so I think that they would have the economic backing to be able to do that. Yeah, that video wasn't clear on, at least it wasn't to me, clear on who the British were subsidizing. So thanks for clearing that up. Uh, also in this video, it went over parts of the different lines. So you had like the infantry, the fusiliers, the grenadiers, the voltigers. I was kind of like, this sounds like French language. Can you guys interpret some of these words for me and kind of let me know what they are, why these guys are called these different things? things. Um, Gofili says fusiliers as well as musketeers was the standard infantry and those were the guys in the center of the line. Both derive their name from their weapon, the musket or fusil, but in the Napoleonic age there wasn't really any difference between these two anymore. But basically they had to light a fuse to fire their gun, the musket, hence the name Fusiliers, I guess. I believe I've seen those guns in movies and stuff before. I need to do videos on these individual weapons so I can kind of see how they worked and all of that. I can't imagine having to fire it, like having to light a match essentially, I guess that's how you did it, and having to light a fuse in order just to fire off one shot. That's crazy. Uh, the Grenadiers were named that because they were armed with the grenades. The tallest and the strongest soldiers were chosen to throw the grenades, I guess for obvious reasons. So I was kind of wondering, well, why are those guys the ones that are the, gren the Grenadiers? But it makes sense when you think about it, I guess. Uh, Voltigers were an invention of the Napoleonic time, skirmishing tactics, small fights in front of the battle lines, sniping, disrupting the enemy's advance, had become a staple of infantry tactics since the American Wars. Here we go back to kind of like the American army and what they did and how they kind of learned how to do a lot of that from the Native Americans. Obviously because I'm an American, that's kind of interesting to me. Like what effect did the American army have on this sort of fighting? Obviously, it wasn't a huge one. I think that they contributed just in a really small way to it. I'd like to kind of dive into that a little bit more and learn more about that. Uh, Cheesy Chaplin says, etymology nerd here. The word Iberia is a bit of a complicated history, but the summary is that Greek geographers called it Iberia because it was the land south of what is known as the Erbo River. Okay, so the Iberian Peninsula is Greek 
in origin, as far as the name goes anyway. So nice to know where that name came from. Uh, Yazik V2 Main, you have made it into my comments. Again, I'm seeing you a lot these days. I had a question about why the Austrian commander, I forgot his rank, uh, decided to not defend the Austrian capital of Vienna. To me, in modern day, that seemed like a really dumb decision. Like, why wouldn't you want to defend your country's capital? But a lot of you let me know that's not really the way it was back then. So, so Yazik, you say, why did he not defend the capital? There is a really good reason for this. It'll turn into a siege battle where the attacker will surround the city and cut you off from supplies. That's actually a good point. They will also use their artillery to bombard the city and destroy large parts of it. If you instead withdraw your army to a suitable place outside the city, you still have the ability to retreat or make other strategic movements of your forces. All right, so when you put it that way, it makes sense why he decided to let Vienna just be taken. Renzo says gorilla comes from the Spanish word um hmm my Spanish pronunciation is not great uh would you say that I know you roll the R's, but I can't roll R's, so... It means war and then gorilla. You know, I think the Spanish, you know, they, they make the double L a Y sound, so it'd be something like, uh, you know what, I'm not gonna try and, and pronounce it in Spanish. But it means little war. We call it guerrilla war, which is, you know, minor skirmishing with the only objective of attacking low defended forces and supply routes. Yeah, I've always uh, been kind of told that guerrilla war means that you're using cover and kind of doing the skirmishing thing in smaller groups instead of doing like the big line fighting that we're seeing in these videos. Uh, Charles Borden says just a historical heads up the Pony Express would be another 50 years in the future. Route ran from St. Joseph, Missouri to San Francisco, California. It only lasted 18 months before going out of business just after the Transcontinental Telegraph went online. So kind of bad timing on the part of the Pony Express I guess. Yeah we learned about the Pony Express in school. For some reason I thought it was on the East Coast too. Like it had connected pretty much the entire country. That's interesting that it's not on the East Coast though. So. Uh, Raph Ball L says, answering your question, the idea of a modern uniform, which is camouflage, appeared in the British Army under the influence of the First Anglo-Afghan War and other wars in British India, so the 1840s. Oh, that I didn't know it went that far back, actually. That's that's pretty cool. This this is when the khaki uniform was born. Khaki in Pashtun means dirt or dust. For the troops of the British Empire in India, it meant sand gray uniforms. The first instance I can think of of the American military using any sort of attempt at camouflage would have been around the I think Spanish American War. Yeah okay so I just looked it up. I was right. The Spanish American War that took place around uh, like 1900 and I just remember seeing pictures of them in like that khaki uniform type thing so maybe they got the idea from the British. I also mentioned in the last video I didn't really understand why Napoleon felt it was necessary to go into Spain since Spain was an ally of France. Uh, Siwi here lets me know that Napoleon took over Spain because he thought he could rule it better. Remember how that video mentioned that he had a disdain for the Spanish royals? Well he saw them as idiots and himself as a genius who would make Spain a much better and stronger country by ruling it through his brother. So I'm picking up this trait of Napoleon and based on a lot of your comments that he always felt that he could do things better if he just did it himself and uh, nepotism was rife in Napoleon's domain it seems like so. Uh, Alex says this battle is a turning point especially with the loss of irreplaceable good commanders and generals plus you'll be thrilled if you like the dramatic. Yeah this was definitely like the most dramatic battle yet that I remember in this entire series. It really had me captivated from start to finish. Uh, Grofili again says the name Iberia goes back to the old Romans. It referred mainly to the land of the river Hebrus, the modern Ebro region, and from that became a label for the whole region of the land beyond that river. Okay, so he says the um, Iberia goes back to Roman times. The other commenter said Greece. Uh, which one's right? Is it Greek or Roman? Um, Stephen Butler here says rule of thumb, an attacking force needs to be three times that of 
of a defending force. Why is that exactly? Is that because the defending force is usually pretty dug in and they've got kind of the advantage in the battle? So you need just sheer numbers in order to overwhelm them and, and win the battle? Skit Dufour says 80% of English military vocabulary comes from the French language as France has long been the role model to follow for anything related to military from the Middle Ages. This is uh, really interesting to me. Obviously time changes things, but when I think about military forces in the world, France isn't the first one you think about today. However, obviously that wasn't the case a couple hundred years ago. It's just interesting to me how France has this huge history and reputation as being like one of the most formidable militaries in the world. And it just seems like over the last hundred years or so, that's shifted a lot. So like I said, interesting how time changes things. Uh, Ryan Abercrombie says, from Britain's perspective, they were stressed really thin by global commitments. By the time the Battle of Austerlitz in 1805, more than 60,000 of the 160,000 strong British army was stationed amongst its colonial possessions with the remainder guarding Britain and Ireland. Putting a large army like their allies had on the continent was impossible for the British, so they made up for it in cash subsidies to help the allied armies in the field. Again, totally makes sense when you think of it in that way. I have to say as an American, I feel like I can relate to this with your military stretch thin across the globe. Uh, Andy P says you'll probably get explanations of the reason for troops wearing the same color, but I was told the reason why the British army chose red was to hide the fact of being wounded to the rest of their troops. I think I saw a couple more comments mention that, that the red was to hide blood. That's, uh, I would have never guessed that in a million years, that that's why they wore red. I don't know, is that true? Alright, so I think that's gonna do it for the comments on this video. I appreciate more than you know all of the information that you leave for me here. It's like I get to watch the video and then your comments are almost like a textbook in a way of me getting to read more to supplement the video, answering my questions. It's really, really great. So I couldn't learn all of this stuff without you guys. So thanks so much for your contributions. Also Roger too, he's really enjoying it. All right, so that's gonna bring us back to the next battle in this series, Bagram. I believe is, is how you say that. I'm, I'm hope I'm probably just a horrible mispronunciation of that city, but I have a distinct feeling that Napoleon is going to come back here, probably because the word revenge is in the title. <laughs> But my guess is that he gets some revenge on Austria. Let's check it out. In May 1809, the Austrians had defeated Napoleon's army in the bloody Battle of Asper. His enemies took heart. After years of French military dominance, it seemed the tide was turning at last. Three weeks later, Pope Pius VII excommunicated Napoleon for annexing papal land, another propaganda coup for his enemies. But in the wake of its victory, Austria hesitated, not sure whether to seek peace or continue the war, while Napoleon responded with a hurricane of activity. He summoned reinforcements to join him near Vienna. The Army of Italy, under his stepson Eugène de Beauharnais, and 11th Corps under Marshal Marmont, who'd together driven Archduke John's Austrian army out of North Italy, as well as Marshal Bernadotte's Saxon 9th Corps. Napoleon's army grew from 90,000 to a massive 164,000 men and 544 guns to take on Charles's army of 128,000 and 414 guns. Six weeks after his first attempt had ended in defeat, Napoleon ordered his army to cross the river once more. This time his engineers had built solid bridges across the Danube to ensure there was no repeat of the disasters of Aspern. Hmm. For the French army, Napoleon declared, the Danube no longer exists. The stage was set for the largest battle yet seen in European history. It's a good job you're not any taller. Napoleon to a staff officer whose helmet was knocked off by a cannonball. On the evening of the 4th of July, in heavy rain, the French began crossing from the island of Lobau, not towards the devastated villages of Aspern and Essling, but east, towards Gross-Enzersdorf, which was soon ablaze from French shells. 
Archduke Charles had left only a small advance guard to delay the French. By dawn, General Massena's IV Corps and Oudinot's II Corps were driving those troops back, winning space for the French army to deploy. Where are the Austrians? At 1pm, Napoleon was ready to begin his advance, across six miles of flat cornfields, towards the main Austrian position. The Austrians are very spread out here. I don't know if that's good or bad. Probably bad. <laughs> that's interesting. Did they know that? I mean, surely they knew that Napoleon was there and would probably try to attack them. It just looks like they don't have a very concentrated force to take him on here. An escarpment known as the Wagram, 100 meters behind the Rusbach stream. As General Lasalle's light cavalry and Massena's fourth corps swung left to guard the flank, Oudinot's second corps and Davout's third corps advanced towards the Wagram. Bernadotte's Saxon corps and Eugène's army of Italy filled the centre. At 6 p.m., unsure of the enemy's strength, Napoleon ordered a full-scale assault against the Wagram plateau. But his troops met determined Austrian resistance along the line. By dusk, the Saxon 9th Corps had pushed into the village of Deutsch Wagram. The Saxon infantry wore white uniforms, like the Austrians, and as darkness fell, were mistaken for the enemy oh, and no. fired on by friendly units. The Saxons panicked and fled with heavy losses. Napoleon's attempt at a quick breakthrough had failed. That night, both armies slept in the open, while Charles and Napoleon planned their next moves. Well, that was unfortunate about the uniforms. Interesting that we had that chat about them from the last video. On the second day, Napoleon planned for Davout's Third Corps to lead the attack, rolling up the Austrian flank, while his other corps pinned down the enemy with local attacks. But to the Emperor's fury, he learned that overnight, without orders, Marshal Bernadotte had withdrawn his battered Saxons from Adakla, which the Austrians now occupied. Adakla was a crucial strongpoint in the centre of the battlefield. Napoleon gave orders for its immediate recapture. But the French and Saxon attack failed, with heavy losses. The Austrians had their own problems. Archduke Charles, knowing he faced a superior enemy, had decided his only chance of victory lay in an all-out dawn attack. He was relying on his brother, Archduke John, reaching him with 13,000 reinforcements, in time to support the attack on the left. But by dawn, there was still no sign of him. What's more, as 4th Corps began its assault on Grosshofen, on time, 3rd Corps, which had received its orders late, was still getting into position, holding up the entire Austrian right wing. The Austrians do not have their logistics down on this one at all. Also, what if Bernadette, why did he retreat from that Adurkla? I'm not saying that right. Why did he retreat from that? What was his decision based on? Charles had to tell 4th Corps to abort its unsupported attack until the other corps were ready. With the Austrians paralysed by delays, come back, come at 10am, Davout began his attack. A fierce infantry battle erupted in the village of Markgraf Neusiedl, while in the fields, dragoons and hussars fought a giant whirling cavalry battle, as each side tried to outflank the other. Davout's corps took the village. Though they couldn't stop the Davu. Austrians withdrawing to a strong new position on the Vag. Davu is the guy that was brilliant, right? Like more brilliant than Napoleon? I think that's that was him. Though they couldn't stop the Austrians withdrawing to a strong new position on the Wagram escarpment. Meanwhile, a serious threat had developed to Napoleon's left flank and rear. Klinau's sixth corps had driven back the outnumbered French with some units advancing as far as Essling, dangerously close to Napoleon's vital river crossings. Hmm. Napoleon urgently needed to reinforce his left flank, 
but he was also determined to hold back his reserves for a decisive attack. So he ordered Massena's 4th Corps to march across the battlefield and reinforce the left. A huge redeployment like this, right in front of the enemy, was high risk. So Marshal Bessières was ordered to lead a cavalry attack straight against the enemy centre. Casualties were high. Even Marshal Bessières had his horse killed under him, to the alarm of his men. But the enemy was kept busy, while 4th Corps completed its redeployment and forced Klinau's corps to fall back. A trooper isn't dead by 30 is a coward, and I don't anticipate exceeding that length of time. Um, Napoleon now assembled a grand battery of more than 80 cannon in the centre of the battlefield. This was one of Napoleon's trademark tactics, a concentration of artillery to blast the enemy line and pave the way for a decisive French attack. The Grand Battery fired an estimated 15,000 rounds, setting light to the cornfields. Wow. Around 1pm, Napoleon ordered a general attack. As Davout continued to batter at the enemy flank, 4th Corps would advance on the left, 2nd Corps on the right, while in the centre, General Macdonald would lead forward 8,000 men of the Army of Italy, formed up in a giant three-sided square to secure his flanks. 15,000 uh, cannonballs basically were fired, if I understood that correctly. Uh, how many, how many cannons did they have? to do that because that is a lot and from what I've seen you can't just shoot one after the other really quickly I it takes time to like reload the cannon I think so to be able to fire out 15,000 rounds of cannonballs in that amount of time that almost seems impossible well he said he had like 500 cannons total right 500 something but they're not all in that one spot either so let's say that they had like 300 so if he had like 300 cannons that would be like 50 cannonballs each 15,000 if my I'm just doing that in my head that might not be right well maybe that's doable it just seems like a really high number to me but despite the terrible French cannonade Austrian 3rd Corps and Grenadiers of the Reserve met the French advance with torrential fire. MacDonald's giant square was cut to pieces, its men mowed down en masse by cannon fire, and the attack stalled. But the Austrian army, battered by relentless French attacks, was near breaking point. Every part of the line was under pressure from the French. Archduke Charles, determined above all to keep his army intact, ordered a retreat. The Austrian withdrawal was disciplined and well executed. Napoleon had his victory. But his army was also so shattered by fatigue and heavy losses, it was unable to launch any effective pursuit. Hmm. Yeah, I was about to ask, why is he not just going after them? Why is he just letting them go, but that answered my question. It's obvious that you were not at Wagram. The Battle of Wagram was a brutal slugging match, the biggest and bloodiest battle yet seen in European history. Really? French victory came at unprecedented cost. Okay, so French dead and wounded is 27,000. Austrians are 24,000. Missing or captured. On the French side are 10,000. Austrian missing or captured 17,000. 12 standards and 21 guns lost. 10 standards and 20 guns lost. What are, what's a standard? The guns are the cannons, I know that. That is a lot. I mean, you're talking 30, 40,000 people total when you combine the missing and the dead together on each side. 37 and a half thousand casualties against 41,500 Austrian. Four days later, French troops caught up with the retreating Austrians at Znaim. As the fighting escalated, Charles knew he could not withstand the French a second time, and asked for a ceasefire. 
but he had not consulted his older brother, Emperor Francis, who was furious when he heard the news. Not least because long-awaited British support was finally on the way. Three weeks after the Battle of Znaim, the largest amphibious force Britain had ever assembled, 35 ships of the line and 39,000 troops, landed at Volcheron Island on the Scheldt estuary. Its aim was this. to destroy French shipping and naval stores. But following the successful bombardment and capture of Vlissingen, British commanders let the initiative slip from their grasp. Their force was bottled up by French troops on the marshy Dutch coast, where it was decimated by fever and dysentery. Mm. About 4,000 died. Many more became permanent invalids. The survivors were evacuated back to England in December. Well, that went about like uh, Spain did, it seemed like. Maybe worse than Spain. Emperor Francis, informed of the British debacle, and persuaded by his generals that Austria couldn't fight on, made peace with Napoleon. In October, Austria signed the Treaty of Schönbrunn, giving up territory to the French Empire, Bavaria, Saxony, the Duchy of Warsaw, and Russia. In total, the Austrian Empire was stripped of three and a half million subjects, forced to pay an indemnity, limit its army to 150,000 men, and join Napoleon's continental system, which meant... Um, why, though, is Napoleon only taking these small bits of it? I would think he would take the whole thing. That doesn't make sense to me. ...intending all trade with British ships and merchants. Yeah, so they're cut off from Britain, basically. Archduke Charles, meanwhile, one of Napoleon's more skilled opponents, had fallen out so bitterly with his brother, Emperor Francis, that he never held active command again. Hmm. Napoleon had won another crushing victory, but there were worrying signs for the French Emperor. His enemies were learning, while he would increasingly have to rely on young conscripts to fill the gaps left by veterans killed or wounded on campaign. Few could have guessed in 1809, but Napoleon had just fought his last victorious campaign. Wow. All right, so at the end there, a little preview of what's to come. Looks like Napoleon's going to have kind of a rough time from here on out. So looking forward to see how all of that plays out. That last little picture that showed Napoleon on his horse, that white horse. I'm kind of wondering, did Napoleon, what was the horse's name? Was that like a big, you know, thing to Napoleon, him and his horse? Kind of like, you know, the Lone Ranger in silver or whatever. So another good video. If you could answer any of my questions that I had in this one, I'd appreciate it. There were definitely some things on there that I didn't quite understand why things happened the certain way that they did. So hopefully you can enlighten me on all of that. We'll be moving on to the next video in this series, I believe. Uh, he goes back to Spain in the next one, so we'll see what the situation is like in Spain at this point. But if you enjoyed this video, make sure that you like and subscribe. Roger and I are looking forward to finishing out this series with you. We've got quite a few more videos left to go, so stay tuned as always, and we will see you next time.